This is a Nexus special, episode 51, Google I.O. 2017, on May 18th, 2017. And now, what could possibly go wrong? This Nexus special is hosted by Ian Arbuck and Ryan Rampersad. Find the show notes for this Nexus special at thenexus.tv slash ns51. So, Ryan. Hi, Ian. This uh, Google I.O. kind of snuck up on us. Oh, man. I have had this happen to me twice in a row now. Just, yeah. Just these, these last few years, they just sneak up on you now. I actually forgot that the keynote was going to be happening until I like sat down in this in the staff lounge after I was finished teaching and I saw I just happened to look at Twitter and I saw somebody tweeting about Google I.O. and I was like oh crap <laughs> yeah I, I had no idea and you know this, this time of year this is when all those big conferences happen mm-hmm. and here we are already yep um all right, so if you are interested in watching like the full keynote that we're about to talk about, um, it's two hours long, uh, but it's uh, it's up on YouTube. The link, it's riveting. Yeah, the, the link to that is in uh, the show notes. Um, if you want a shorter summary of it, uh, The Verge has like a compilation video um, that's also in the show notes. Or you could listen to us talk about it for you know 40, to, 40 minutes to an hour. I'm not sure how long we're going to go here. It's the best of both worlds because it's, it's not as long, it's not as short. It's really good, though. But we still go in depth. Probably. Hopefully. All right. So obviously at Google I.O., they always introduce uh, new products. um, And they started off with a new old product, kind of. (laughs) (laughs) This one is uh, Google Lens, um, which is where your, your phone, it accesses its camera and it looks at something, and then it identifies it, and then it allows you to do something with that information. And my first thought was, all right, so it's Google Goggles. And my first thought was, so it like it's Bixby. And then after you mentioned that, I also thought of the Amazon Fire Phone, which I believe was able to identify like products specifically. That's right. And then it would direct you to Amazon's uh, store listing for that product. Yeah. So old old stuff is new again. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And I'm surprised because like I'm pretty sure that Google Lens or Google Goggles, sorry, is still available in the Play Store. So like, is that going away? Is that being updated and being renamed to Google Lens? I'm not sure. It's just like Google. I mean, just they have an old product. It's not cool anymore. So make a new one that's pretty much the same. And yeah. yeah. Um. Now they are bringing. Google Lens to a few places that Google Gal Google. Maybe <laughs> There's that's a lot why of they, G's there. Maybe that's why they renamed it. Definitely. Uh, where goggles was not available, for example, you'll be able to access its functionality directly from the assistant, um, or which is kind of like how na- I believe you could do that with now on tap. Right. Exactly. Back, uh, back last year. Yeah. Um, it, it's sort of like expanding the contextual awareness of now. So instead of just mm-hmm. being what's on the screen, it's also what's in your camera's viewfinder. Yep. Um, and then also, this one is really, really nice. Um, and I'm surprised that they didn't think of this before. But uh, when you're looking at your library of photos in Google Photos, uh, you can th- there will be a little button there to use Google Lens to identify what's in that picture. That's so, neat. So you don't need to even think about it right when you're taking the picture, you could think of it later on and be like, oh, yeah, like, what what kind of flower was that that I was looking at? Very important questions. Yeah, I think that's really cool. I think it's a nice thing to add. Mm-hmm. Um, they, of course, were talking uh, a lot about their AI. Um, and their efforts. other favorite word, which is machine learning. Machine learning, yes. So they now have uh, a website called Google.ai where you can go to utilize some of their um some of their machine learning tools um first they talked about their new tpus which are tensor processing units because tensor is the name of their like machine learning system yep and uh and so these these are like physical processors there that they i think you can purchase or maybe maybe they have them on their own servers and you can purchase time yeah so so the idea is there's something called um Google um, Compute Engine, which is their equivalent to Amazon Web Services, AWS. Mm -hmm. And so um, they have TensorFlow 
capacity already available in their cloud, but these TPUs will uh, greatly expand the, that offering. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so, yeah, they're trying to make these these AI tools like just available to more developers, um, which is pretty cool. I I'm, look forward to seeing what other developers come up with. Yep, this is right in sorts. line with what um, Amazon started offering late last fall. Um, they had some uh, machine learning and um, natural voice learning stuff. Okay, okay, yeah. yeah. Yep. Nice. Um, another AI-related thing that they brought up is that they are now bringing smart replies to Gmail. Um, smart replies being a feature that has previously existed in Inbox and in Allo, um, where it'll it'll read a message that that you're replying to and come up with like three different possibilities of what you are likely to say as like your first sentence. Um, for lazy people like me, I think that's great. Mm -hmm. No problem with that. I'm surprised that they it took them this long to bring it to Gmail. So I guess that that was kind of their way of of having like a soft beta of the uh, of the product before bringing it to a you know the interface that most people use for their emails. Yeah, probably. I I don't know if they maybe they just had to think about how to integrate it into their uh, apps or I don't know because I mean they, I mean they had it integrated into inbox already and i can't imagine that the technicalities of having it in inbox are any different than having well, it in the gmail app i'm sure it's like so they need to have at least five teams to run gmail i'm sure they have another 20 teams to run inbox mm -hmm. so not surprising yep yeah um all right let's get more into the google assistant um because the google assistant has a I think it, this is its first year anniversary, right? Its um, existed since it launched, Google I.O.? It launched last year with I.O. and then formally existed on the Pixel. Right, yes, and Allo. Yep. Right, which and, I don't count because right. nobody and, uses that. And and the Google Home. So Sure, yes. There when you go. did that launch? Did that launch with the Pixel? That was in the fall. That was okay. in like November. Yeah. Yep. So um, – they're bringing a couple new things to the Google Assistant. First off, and I'm so, so happy about this mm -hmm. one, they are introducing typing support. Uh, so you no longer have to talk to it, which I think has been the biggest barrier to me personally using the Assistant on a regular basis. Yep. Um, because like the, quite often I'm either in like a loud room or I'm in a quiet room where I don't want to disturb everybody else by talking to my stupid phone. Yep. <sighs> um weird and, that it took a year though I, I don't know about that yeah and i'm yeah it, it's 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 so much easier for on google's end to be able to handle text input yeah they can skip the whole voice to words mm -hmm. translation yeah mm -hmm. um yeah as mentioned before they're also bringing uh integration of google lens into the assistant um and for our ios using friends uh it is now on iphone which is pretty nice um it it obviously it won't be able to do any of like the system level things that um that siri could do such as like uh setting an alarm you know or um yeah or changing any settings or that kind of thing right. um but it can do it, it but it can do a lot of the things that depend on google's own services um so like when you when you ask the google assistant to set a reminder it's being set in Google's reminder system. So that'll pop up in like inbox or on your calendar or whatever. Um, whereas like, you know, if you ask Siri to set a reminder, I think that's just a reminder that exists right there locally on the phone. Yep. Um, yeah. If you ask it to like, if you ask the Google assistant to, for directions, it'll like, you know, open up in Google maps. Um, and I think, I think it does, it does manage to do some things like, making phone calls or sending like text messages um but i it can't do them like automatically it'll like write down the message that you told it and then like share that with the messaging app and then like and then you have to physically press the send button um, oh, what a flexible system yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um but yeah so it's it's nice seeing it uh on the iphone now i did try to install it on the school ipad just to try it out and see see what it's like of course it's not supported on that model it's uh <laughs> yeah right yeah 
So, other new things, speaking of that, uh, Google Assistant SDK will be available sometime later this year, probably, and there's this weird thing called Google Assistant built-in. So it's almost as Hmm. if they are intending this SDK to be for products that aren't first-party Google products like Google Home. Right. Other things. And they'll have the Google Assistant built into them for some reason, I guess. It seems kind of similar to how they're bringing the Google Assistant to uh, Android TV app devices, right? Which are not all made directly by Google. Yeah, and I'm so. skeptical about anybody actually doing it. <laughs> well, I think it uh I think it exists on the like newest version of the Sh- Nvidia Shield TV, not the Shield tablet, but the mm-hmm. but the Android the TV. TV one. Yeah. Right. Um and yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I mean, Android TV no traction really. <laughs> um I, I I really don't know if vendors care enough or even will bother. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. No. And there are a few smart TVs that have Android TV built in, so that is possibly an area where it exists more than as like a separate set top box. You know, maybe maybe it could be good on those TVs that have the Chromecast built in. Yeah, mm-hmm. that that that's easier sell. No, yeah, we'll see. Um, they're also bringing the Google Assistant to more. Um, more languages. Um, so Italian, Korean, and Spanish are the ones that it's coming to, I believe. Um, they're also opening up uh, more actions on Google. And I, I believe those are specifically tie-ins to the Google Assistant, right? Just like yes. how they were. So, so yeah, this is kind of building on the actions that developers could build into the Google Home. Um, and now those actions will be available in more places than just the Google Home. So any device that has the Google Assistant uh, will be able to use these actions. Um, and one of the big things that they're now adding is they will support transactions. Um, so the payment method, the identity, the notifications, um, you know, any like addresses, that all is being pulled from your Google account. Um, so the people who are making these actions don't have to actually handle any of that information. Yep, I think that's really nice. Um, they they showed a really nice demo um, about ordering food from Panera. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was really cool. I don't think I would ever do that, ever. Yeah, it depends. I mean, yeah. <laughs> for for me, it definitely depends on uh, whether or not it's more expensive to order a thing from Panera, or, from Panera than to, like, bike over there and get it myself. I, I just wouldn't want to risk having the order be wrong because I talked to it. I mm-hmm. don't trust it at all. Well, yeah, and of course they were, yeah. So that's definitely a concern if you're doing it via the Google Home, but they were showing it via the assistant on your phone still which don't you trust can, it which you can see exactly what is being ordered and how much it costs i'm driving i can't look down while you're driving you shouldn't be talking to your phone anyway why wow, you can do that um yeah but you shouldn't be i did my senior seminar on infotainment systems in cars and i'm telling you you shouldn't be using infotainment systems in cars oh i agree but yeah you can do that mm-hmm. watch out for cars all right let's move on to talking about the google home specifically um, it is coming to new countries now. Um, so previously it was available in just the U.S. and U.K. Now it will be in Canada. Hilarious that it was available in the U.K. before Canada, by the way. Yeah, I don't know what that means. I don't know uh, why. Um, it'll be in Australia, France, Germany, and Japan. So I have a question about that. Yeah. So they're, they're, I don't know how when that Google Home came out originally. So maybe September, October, maybe something like that. Something like that. So, do you think we're going to get an updated version this year if they're releasing new countries this late in the game? You'd think that if they were bringing out a new version of it, there would have they would have talked about that here at Google I.O. Would they? I mean, they kind of just, like, brought it out five months later last well, didn't, year. Uh, didn't they talk about... Didn't they hint at it at all during Google I.O.? Oh, yeah, they certainly did, but they didn't release it until way later in no, the year. No, yeah, 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 because they, yeah, they had their Made by Google event that they released all of their new hardware stuff. Right. Um, yeah, I don't think that they're going to be coming out with a new version of it. Okay. They can, think just, so. they can just virtually add another neural net to get a fourth um, microphone. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, that's essentially what happened when they, you know, they launched it without, like, multiple, um, multiple user support. Oh, I so, understand. So now, you know, they, they just added that in uh, via software. 
Um, yeah. By the way, we should probably at some point record another, you know, review now that it has kind of the all of the features that it's going to have for a while. Eh. Eh. I have Moving time. on. <laughs> um, so we have um, something called proactive assistance, which is basically it tells you things if you didn't even ask for it. Yep. And that seems like a great idea to me because, like, the the Google Home seems kind of like smartwatches in this regard. That it's like, it's it's a great device if you never really think about it until right. you need it. Um, and a large part of that is it bringing information to your attention. So if it can do that and do it well and not annoy the heck out of me, uh, then then that'd be good. It's also I wonder how it'll deal with the fact that I am often not the one in the room. Yeah, that was I was wondering about that. My other question about how the proactive notification system works is how do app developers get to tie into it? Because what if it's like push notifications ended up being, which is basically a spam ball. Mm -hmm. So that's something they have to really balance and police hard. Yeah. Did you do you remember what the example was that they had for Um they made some kind of like traffic example, but I didn't really understand how okay. that was any different than just asking like what's the traffic like? Mhm. I didn't think it was a good enough example. Now, here's a new feature that I am super excited about is uh being able to call people via the Google Home. Um it's uh, it, it can connect to any landline or mobile number in North America for free, um, and it'll be using your actual phone number. And I can understand, okay, as a Project Fi subscriber, I can understand that it easily could have access to my phone number and use that. Um, but like for example, we Savannah's account is is on the Google Home now. Mm -hmm. And she's on T-Mobile, so are we going to have to like tell it like here's my phone number? Uh, just pretend like tell tell the receiving person that that's the number that it's coming from. Maybe I don't know. Does that does it work like that? Um, I don't know. The other thing that I thought is that it could proxy through your actual phone, but that would be bizarre. That would be really bizarre. Yeah, because like I I don't think that you necessarily have to have your phone with you when you make the call through Google. No. Phone. Yeah, that's why it's bizarre. I, I'm not sure how that would work. Yeah, um, and I. They didn't say anything about it being able to receive phone calls, so it definitely, you know, I it it definitely doesn't have to tie into like T-Mobile, for example, in order so, to work with her number. So what we can do is, um, whenever this rolls out, we can um, do a podcast over our Google Homes. <laughs> uh, this you have the worst ideas, you know that I do. Ah. <laughs> uh, um, they're also adding a bunch of new music and video services to the assistant. Um, so I think SoundCloud is coming. Um, they're bringing uh, like the the free free sub people who are using uh, Spotify for free um, will be able to use it, not just the people who are on a monthly subscription. Um, I noticed on the video side, I think I saw Hulu. Uh, that was one of the logos. So yeah, good cool. stuff. Um, I I want to be able to. Like most of these, most of these are services that already you could, you know, cast from your from your phone to whatever device you wanted to in, in your in your house. Um, but being able to just talk to the Google Home and and get it to cast that stuff for you is is great. Yeah. Uh, funny thing, uh, I asked earlier about if they would make a new Google Home later this year. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe not because they magically added Bluetooth support. Just Oh, we turned it on. Cool. Yeah. Hey, it's always been there. And uh, so this this one's actually, I feel really weird about this one because it seems like a step backwards, you know? They they always talk about, in terms of Google Cast, they're like, it's such a it's such a better solution than Bluetooth thing because you don't have to worry about any of the pairing or you don't have to worry right. about like walking out of range and, and stuff. And there's higher, uh, higher bandwidth over Wi-Fi mm -hmm. if you're uh, streaming something from your phone directly. Yep. Yeah. And and here they are just being like, oh, yeah, Bluetooth. Yeah, we'll put that in. Okay. I guess somebody cares. Um, they are also allowing the Google Home to respond to you visually in some cases. And this is the this is the feature. Yeah, this is the big one. So it will 
like if you if you ask it specific things where it would make sense for it to give you a visual response instead of just an audio one it will either like put that as like kind of a lower third on your like uh, Chromecast or or Android TV, um, or it'll send it to your phone, um, depending. Um, so like for example, I think they when when the user was asking about like a TV show, it popped that up on the TV. Um, if if you asked about like how long it's going to take to get to my next calendar appointment, um, you know then it would send the directions directly to your phone so that you just have that pulled up already as you're walking out the door um great stuff i think that's that's going to be one of the big things that encourages me to use google home more than i already do yep so i wondered how they would solve the issue with people having multiple devices so it'll probably prefer phone over tablet or something Mm -hmm. um and then I wondered how it would know which um, TV to Chromecast the answers to. So I wonder if it has the capability of knowing if there's a Chromecast or, you know, whatever TV in nearby somehow. Right. Um, I I believe that when you set up some of your devices, it a- it does ask you, like, what room is this one in? Um, mm, yeah, but I, they could do but it. But I think that was mostly for, like, smart home, you know, like the lights and whatnot. Um, oh right. I don't think it asked about my Android TV. Yeah, I wonder if it um maybe it just maybe you still have to specify which TV to display on. I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. Um shall we move on to Google Photos now? Yes. All right. So Google Photos, this is one of the best products that Google has come out with in recent years and they're they're taking like kind of the direction that made it so great and improving upon that Mm -hmm. again and i'm super super happy about this um so first up the thing that they the big thing that they're bringing is called suggested sharing where um let's say that you know you go to uh, on a trip with a few people or you go to like a party or something and you take some pictures um and even though Google Photos makes it super easy to share those photos with other people, you still have to remember to do that, right? Um, but not anymore, because Google Photos will now suggest, like, after the fact, it'll it'll give you a notification and say, like, hey, remember those pictures that you took at the party? Here are some really good ones. And here are the people who are in those photos. Do you want to share them with those people? And you'll be like, yeah, sure. Or, nah, no way. Um and uh, so, yeah, it, it, it's a way it, it keeps you in control of what you're sharing. Right, Ryan? Um, but it uh, <laughs> maybe <laughs> maybe. Yeah. But it, um, you know, but it's just a nice little reminder to to get you off your button to and to do that. Yeah. It's very difficult to hit a button to share your pictures. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I like the idea. Um, hopefully it isn't too annoying or, you know, I take a picture of the dog and it wants to share it to my dog's Google account. Uh, please tell me that you do have a Google account just for your dog. I do not. Oh, Ryan. Because that would be so you. I know. Um, another one that I'm really excited about now that, you know, I am uh, engaged to be married is shared libraries. Um, so let's say that you've got somebody who you share most of your pictures with already anyway, um, or mm-hmm. maybe you should share them with them uh, anyway. And... Uh, shared libraries will allow you to specify like different uh not categories but different like situations where all of the photos that fit these criteria should always be shared with this other person um so for like the example that they gave on stage was um you know all of the pictures that this guy takes that have either you know the kids or himself or like his wife uh in the picture those should be shared with his wife automatically. Um, and then there was some there was some subtlety about whether or not the pictures that are shared are automatically added to like her her mm-hmm. home timeline. So apparently there's like a difference between things like photos being in your library and if they show up on your actual timeline. And I'm not sure what the difference is there, but um Anyway, but they but they they can automatically get shared with with your your partner's library. Yeah, I think that's a really cool feature. Um, and unfortunately, neither of these features 
can solve the, pr the, the big problem that I have, which is I take a lot of pictures on my DSLR and mm -hmm. then they're stuck on an SD card until nope. I put them on my hard drive. And then they're stuck on my hard drive until I convert them from raw format into JPEGs and upload them. And there's nothing that Google can do to solve that problem for me. Not so much. I mean, I guess you could just use a Pixel, but yeah, yeah. If it's I not had, a solution. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Now that I have a Nexus 5X that has a much better camera than the Nexus 5 did, um, I I do occasionally take pictures. I'm I'm not averse to taking pictures on my phone anymore. Yep. Yeah. So the other thing they introduced here was photo books. Mm -hmm. Now, photo books is not an app. No, it's a physical I was, book. I was totally expecting it to be, you know, just like those uh, weird versions of photo albums that they had on Google Plus back in the day. Yeah, I don't remember what those were called, but they were like little journeys and you would mm -hmm. step through the pictures and it would show you a map. No, it's not that. A photo book is a physical thing that you get printed on dead trees of pictures you took and it's really cool. Mm hmm. Now, there are other photo book services. I think there's like Shutterfly. and I'm sure that Flickr will sell, sell you a photo book if you want one. Sure, definitely. So yeah. there's there's a lot of services out there already. And incidentally, even Apple has one through um, iPhoto or something. Okay. You can make some pictures go into a photo book somehow. I don't know if it still exists, but it used to exist. They did it in a keynote once. Mm -hmm. Well, here we are. Old is new again. Google's doing it now. And you can order a physical photo book of pictures you've taken and I think base price is um, ten dollars. Yeah, it was ten dollars for a paperback, uh, twenty pages, twenty dollars for a hardcover, um, and then of course if you go above and beyond twenty pages, then the the price goes up like proportionally. Yeah, um, Amazon actually has started rolling out a service called Amazon Prints, mm. and it also has this capability now too. So everybody's in on it. Um, some of the cool things is that it can suggest photos for you to put in it, which is nice. I guess. Yeah, Maybe I could... think. Uh, yeah, I think that's kind of the big, the standout feature that differentiates it from most of these other photo book yeah. printing things. Well, one of the nice things I think that it can do is just like that journey thing in Google Plus back in the day, is that it can put them sort of in a chronological order, mm -hmm. and then it can like I don't know, provide backgrounds or something to help you make it look pretty. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's really nice. Yep, and. Um... Yeah, I, I can think of a few people who could uh, benefit from, from the feature of having photos suggested for it because I saw some photo books that were printed <laughs> off from like my cousin's wedding and I was like, who decided to put this awful photo into this thing? They're, Just a blurry picture. You can't picture take it out grass. anymore. It's printed. No. Yeah. Uh, oh, well. Yep. Uh, let's talk about my favorite platform, your least favorite platform, Ryan, YouTube. Oh, I hate YouTube. <laughs> I love YouTube. Um, <laughs> a couple of new things, nothing, nothing spectacularly big, um, from the YouTube team. I was, when they came on stage, I was like, Ooh, are they going to address a uh, adpocalypse, you know, and talk about how they're going to bring advertisers back to their platform? No, they didn't mention no, it at all. No, they of can't address not. that. Um, so what they did talk about, though, was 360-degree videos will now be watchable on televisions, um, which is pretty good. Previously, 360-degree videos were only... Well, I mean, you could you can watch them, but you can't move around in them. Uh, no. But you, you, the only mediums where you can uh, turn around in them is when watching it on a desktop or when watching it uh, in the mobile app. Um and now you'll be able to like use the remote uh, for your for your Android TV um, to turn the camera. I think that's nice. Mm -hmm. It's cool. The other feature is something they call Super Chat. Yeah, and uh, Super Chat actually has existed for a couple months now. Um, but they wanted to talk about it again, which yeah. I thought was funny. And I well, I I understand that because a lot of people don't really realize that it is a thing. Um, because I I feel like live streaming on YouTube is still a little bit underutilized. Um, yes, I agree with you. So, yeah, what Super Chat is, is when you're in the chat of a live stream, you can pay a little bit of money to highlight your um, your your chat, your comment. And um, depending on how much you pay, you know, it, like, it either just gets highlighted or it can get, like, highlighted and pinned, like, to the, you know, to the bottom of the chat for a certain amount of time or whatever. Um and a portion of that money, of course, goes to the person who is live streaming. So it's kind of like a tip jar at the same time. Yep. So I wondered about 
how some of that revenue splitting works, but not a big deal. Yeah. My other question is, so I don't know how comments work in the um, YouTube streaming live view thing. Mm-hmm. Um, can you like upvote comments or like? Uh, I think not for <laughs> live chats. Okay. But for for comment like regular comments on a on an on demand YouTube video, okay. yeah, you can upvote those and downvote those. It's almost too bad that the only way to have a displayed, highlighted comment is to pay for it instead of just having, you know, people actually like it or something. Right, yeah. Yeah. But things go by too fast. Something about machine learning, right? Yeah, maybe. Well, I, yeah, I, I think that they do use machine learning a little bit already to filter out, you know, spam and stuff Yeah. Um, from live How chats. about if we use it for good instead of evil? <laughs> Um, now the thing that they have added to live chats now that is new is that they are now adding an API that allows creators to rig like physical devices, fi- like things to actually trigger and happen when viewers use super chat. Um, That's cool. so they like what they demonstrated on stage was they had, um, the light system and, you know, like the speaker system hooked up, uh, to, to like flash and make a big like horn sound or something when somebody, um, donated five hundred dollars through. Super I would Chat. probably set my threshold a little bit less, but yes, yeah. definitely. Um, but like, yeah. <laughs> so, so what that brings to mind immediately is like, if you um have a like um you know a charity live stream kind of thing going. Yeah. Um, I've I've seen I've seen other uh kinds of things where like it, like Patreon um um pushes you know in live mm-hmm. streams where they like any time that they get. Uh, a new a new patron at you know like the five dollar level or more kind of thing you know it like displays something on the screen and obviously yep. that is way outside of the api that like youtube would um provide but uh but i think it's a great idea and it's and it's right in line with what everybody else is doing mm-hmm. yep yep Good hey stuff. so you want to talk about uh android that is my favorite platform wait a second your f- favorite platform is youtube oh my bad it's your favorite operating system. Yeah, that too. <laughs> okay, so Android uh, O is mm-hmm. the next Android. And actually, the um, Alpha or Beta or something has been out for a couple of months now. I have not personally tried it because I am in one device mode, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Um, but others have tried it. And, uh, well, there are some new features, such as our favorite feature, Picture in Picture. Hey, wait a minute. Wasn't that coming to Android TV? Hey, wait a minute. Isn't that kind of defeating the purpose of YouTube Red? Hey, hmm. well, actually, uh, ab- according to some people, the journalists who have been trying out picture-in-picture mode, uh, you can only do picture-in-picture from YouTube app if you have YouTube Red. <laughs> hey, isn't that like a paywall feature? Weird. <laughs> oh, man. man. Oh, um, yeah. But yeah, so so what they, the way that they were talking about it on stage almost made it sound like they are now convinced that this is the way that like multitasking on a phone should have worked instead of having like side by side, you know, two apps open yeah. at the same time kind of thing. Um sort and, of. And it makes so so I buy that for things such as video players, right? But if 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 you really bought that, you wouldn't have bought YouTube Red because they wouldn't have forced you to need it. Like they don't even believe that. You mm. shouldn't need YouTube Red which is a subscription service mm-hmm. to use a feature of a native platform. Like right. That. Agreed. Oh, yeah. So 100% agreed. They don't really care at all. Yeah. Um but yeah, it's it it makes perfect sense to me to be able to like have have a video playing on top of whatever it is that I want to actually interact with. Um yep. and not have to have that video like be way over on the side. Um, because like, for example, even here on a desktop environment, right, <laughs> where I have my show notes open and I have a video of, uh, you know, of you, yep. uh, open, it's not really like if, if this were, a, if this were a phone, the you, the video of you would take up the entire half of the screen and there'd be no way around that. Right. I no. wouldn't be able to see anything else, uh, on that half of the screen. So having picture in picture just kind of frees up you know it gives you more possibilities for what you can do yeah cool feature now we have feature parity with ios only took two years um so next is notification dots so have you ever seen an iphone with some little number badges speaking of feature parity 
Hmm. Well, but no, because we didn't get numbers. No. We got dots. <laughs> and I, you know... I'm thinking that I might like it better with just dots than with numbers because, like, a lot of people, like, you look at their home screen on their iPhone and they have, like, ah, 5,000 unread emails, (laughs) you know, as, like, oh, my God. Right. So it's either you have a notification or you don't, and Mm -hmm. then you can swipe up on that app to see that notification contextually. Yep. Which is sort of cool, but I'm looking at Action Launcher, my preferred launcher of choice, Mm -hmm. And I have so many different kinds of dots already on this thing. I don't even know what they all mean. <laughs> well, that's yeah, that's kind of a niche uh, problem. And if if you're somebody who uses Action Launcher, you have made the decision that you are okay with having lots of symbols next to your I like icons. It. Yeah, I love it. So, so do you think that normal people will know that those dots like mean something? And then, do you think normal people will also learn that? swiping gesture to go and see them yeah i th- hmm the the long press gesture it might take people like you might have to teach people that um but the dot i think it it's pretty clearly like a notification type thing um mm-hmm. i think the the like the dot up in a corner is definitely more of a like mac os ios kind of uh yeah. signal um, not really seen in any Google product before now. Uh, you know, even the notifications that they had uh, for like Google Plus were like a, it was a bell icon, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yep. So, um, I like the little bell guy. He was yeah. cool. <laughs> um, so let's see here. Uh, next up, autofill. Hey, sounds like last pass. Specifically, system-wide autofill without needing to enable accessibility services. Yeah. Hey. So, so yeah. This Can is, iOS do that? I don't know. This is the this was the big problem with with using just Chrome as my password manager for a long mm-hmm. time was the fact that like, um, it worked perfectly on my desktop because all of the passwords that I ever wanted to fill were just in my browser, right? Right. Um, but. As soon as I got over to my phone, I wasn't logging into most of my accounts through the browser. I was logging into them through their individual apps. And so yep. this this solves that problem. Um, of course, for me, I already had that problem solved thanks to you suggesting LastPass to me. So I have a question for your LastPass usage. Mm-hmm. Do you use the little autofill tool? Heck or yeah. do you just copy and paste? No, I use the autofill tool. It okay. saves so much time. So a lot of people um, have decided to turn off the autofill tool because accessibility services slows the phone down pretty considerably in some hmm. cases. I haven't noticed that. Because what it has to do is it has to scan for any text field that has the word username or password or and combinations of those. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people turn it off. And so this kind of just bypasses it, so it's a native way to do that. Mm. And I would totally be okay with it not scanning for those at any any given time, as long as it has like a, a persistent notification that I can just pull right. down, tap on, and then be like trigger it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I also should note that um, in LastPass's case, it's definitely only tolerable on devices that have a fingerprint sensor. Oh, I know, right? Because on my tablet, when I want to autofill a password, I still have to go and physically type in my long LastPass password. I'm like, please, please, no. Please be right. I don't want to type it again. (sighs) Okay, so next we have copy plus paste. Yes. Now, now, here's a funny thing. Something about machine learning. Tell me more. Well, uh, using machine learning, you can do magic, like determining which part of a sentence the user is probably going to want to copy before they even do that. Whoa. So, so currently uh, on on Android, if you want to, you know, copy some text, you got to long press on one of the words that's in that phrase, and then like drag these little handles uh, left or right to like you know get to the whole text that you actually want to uh, copy. Um, and what what the Android the developers of the Android operating system have noticed is that most times when people are doing that, they are copying either like a proper noun, so like somebody's name, um, or an address, or a phone number, or like an email address. And so they have uh, built into Android O uh, a way to detect when 
one of those cases is present. And if uh, if a user double taps on part of that phrase, then it will just um, highlight that whole thing and be like, hey, do you want to copy this? Um, and it'll even like put specific like you know for if for an address it'll put a link to google maps if you know it's an email address it'll give you a link to your email application yeah yeah i I think that's really cool i wonder if it requires um so they they said it was on device but i wonder if that's true like really true or just sort of true (laughs) um well, they wouldn't. Con- they wouldn't lie about that, would they, Ryan? No, they would just bend the truth. And um, so the the question is, if when when you highlight something like that, um, does it like save that somewhere and then send it off later? And you know, like what kind of tele- telemetry are they uh, getting out of that? Because um, what I do is I don't use LastPass autofill. I actually copy and paste my passwords, and I don't want them to copy and paste my passwords to their own servers. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a very good point. Mm-hmm. Just saying. Yeah, it, I would expect that if they are getting any telemetry from that, it would only be for the cases where you have double tapped, you know? Yeah. To, you know. My passwords are not proper nouns, so it's okay. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> um, except when it's the name of your dog. It's not. Good. Never will be. Um, Google Play Protect, speaking of keeping things secure, um, they're not actually adding any new any new features here with Google Play Protect, they're just making things more visible. So they're they're going to make users of Android feel like they have a proper virus protection already on their device by telling them, hey, this is an app that we've scanned in the Play Store. It should behave properly because we, we've, you know, checked it out. Um, and so it's, yeah, just kind of giving the indication that that service is being provided. You know, I think I think they still have a long way to go. Like, like sure for malware and stuff. Like people will get fooled into downloading those fake antivirus programs. But mm-hmm. you know, there's there's actual things they could actually monitor, such as, hey, look, an app is using ninety percent of your battery. Let's uh, tell you about it and let's stop that from happening. Oh wait, it's literally Google Play services. Oh, <laughs> we can't tell them about that. I also noticed that they um, renamed the uh, Android Device Manager to Find My Device. <laughs> How original! Feature parody. Yep, yep. Yeah. Um, and I'm. Is that coming pre-installed now? From now on, with Google Play services, because I believe that up until now you've had to go and install it yourself. I. Th- think it's installed and by default it's part of the google play services so you know how like you have regular settings and then google settings Mm -hmm. pretty sure it's in the google settings app yes well so so having a device being able to be found has always been pre-installed but i think the app for for actually going and looking at the map yeah i don't was not pre-installed not yet anyway okay um maybe it will be i don't know they'll have to think about if they want to do that or not yeah it's funny it wasn't built into maps. Now, uh, oh, that's a good point. Um, yeah. <laughs> There's always so many things that would make sense to go into Google Maps that weren't until recently. Mm, location sharing. Hmm. Uh, all right. From a developer's perspective, um, they have some brand new tools, such as the Play Console Dashboard, which um, is a, a suite of tools for Android developers to see like what kinds of problems are affecting performance on their apps um, and like how many of their users are being affected and, you know, just kind of to help troubleshooting situations go more smoothly. Sounds good to me. Definitely. But the more important one here is Kotlin. Woo. So Google has never added a programming language other than Java to Android ever. There were many rumors that suddenly after Swift took off a few years ago from WWDC for Apple's uh, iOS platform that, they would also adopt Swift for some horrible reason. No, that is not happening. Kotlin is the solution. Embrace it. It is the one true language. So why not go? Okay, so here's the deal. So Android runs with Java um, as the language currently. Mm -hmm. But it's not just the language. They also adopted basically the runtime, but it's a runtime they made. Mm Mm-hmm. So it doesn't use like the JVM that Windows uses. It uses sort of a more custom one, but you know, close enough, right? Right. Well, so the problem is Go compiles to native. 
And so they would have to tune a compiler for every platform's, you know, got it. Hardware basically. Right. So the compromise is let's continue to use the JVM, our custom one of course, but it's easier to tune than writing a custom compiler for every platform. And let's use Kotlin which compiles to the JVM spec. Okay. Okay, good. So it's compatible. Um, cool stuff about Kotlin, for example, is you can call into Java APIs and there's no difference to you. So it's completely backwards compatible. It's forwards compatible. It's all compatible. Now, did you notice what they did up on the screen when <laughs> she did. was uh, announcing that Kotlin I did. is a, the new language? It was pretty darn clever. They had, I, they had my... an Android lock screen with its pattern on lock, and they drew a pattern on there that then was filled in with color with to become the Kotlin logo. And I, and I, um, I, I, yeah, I'm speechless. Still, <laughs> somebody needs a raise for that one. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, they do. Whew. All right, now let's say that you are either somebody who lives in an area of the world where, um, you know, the average income is much much lower than the U.S., or maybe you're somebody who lives in the U.S. who does not emphasize technology in your life, and you are not going to spend a whole lot of money on a phone. You you might end up getting an Android device that has significantly less processing power and RAM than the one that I have. So is that called an Android One phone? Is uh, that what you're referring well, to? Well, that was be probably what you would expect, but no. Um, there's a new new initiative that Google Wait. is pushing forward. So it's one of those Google things where what they had before wasn't cool enough, so they're doing it again, but with a different name. Hey, that sounds familiar. Hey, hey okay. Uh, so this one is called Android Go, and this is going to be a specific version of Android designed for low memory, limited connectivity devices. Um, so for example, they are doing things like um, optimizing Google apps for that kind of situation. Um, and uh, and one of the one of the really good examples that that I saw them showing off was uh, YouTube. They they're going to have a specific like YouTube Go version for Android Go devices. Um, and in addition to like using less memory, it also will allow you to like preview still images from the video uh, and choose the video quality before you start watching a video. Um, because a lot of times in areas where you're buying cheap devices, you also don't have, uh, you know, an unlimited data connection, right? Mm -hmm. So you're, you're having to kind of carefully pick and choose, um, you know, what, which videos you're going to watch and make sure that you're actually watching the right video before you start watching the video, etc. Um, and they're also like, bringing things like like kind of peer-to-peer -peer, uh sharing of a video to android go devices oh, so that's really interesting yeah yeah so once one person has downloaded a youtube video as long as you're you know within probably probably bluetooth range i would expect um you know they you can transfer that video to somebody else's device at an amazing 144p bitrate yeah or whatever you um, choose so I I wonder I wonder a lot about this initiative. So Android One was supposed to be the same Android, but just a program to have lower end reference hardware. Right. And now this is a different Android, with which would be maybe okay, but it's even worse because it's focusing and emphasizing different apps. Even. So, do you think the Facebook app would ever release a Facebook Go? They actually showed on the screen uh, Facebook Lite and, yeah, I know. and Twitter Lite. That was a trick question. I already knew that. Yeah, good. <laughs> no, because Facebook Lite's existed and they, they already thought about this. But what about other apps that maybe aren't as big as Facebook but that people still use? Uh, Are you talking about Snapchat? Maybe. I don't watch TV, though. Because, I, I mean, Sna that... Snapchat is such a hot mess uh, when you try to run it on Android anyway. Like... If they came out with a version for Android Go, I would probably download that instead of the regular Snapchat app. <laughs> well, sure. I was thinking maybe like WhatsApp or maybe in um in in the Asian countries maybe like WeChat or um, mm -hmm. Line. Um, I don't think there are super many vendors that will care about making a separate app just for these lower end devices. Right. Yeah. 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 Um. And, and, and what, what what's really weird is that they want they they're almost encouraging more fragmentation. Why yeah, would you do this? Yeah, yeah. Um, 
I think what would be nice is if they still encouraged um, app developers to do this. And by the way, the way that they're encouraging this right now is uh, if you're using an Android Go device, uh, it will highlight device or apps that have been specifically written for Android yeah. Go mm-hmm. devices. Um, if for like, you know, I think it would be really nice if they had maybe one Play Store entry for the Facebook app, and then depending on if you are on regular Android or Android Go, it will download whichever version of the app is more appropriate for your situation. Um, and then and then they would just highlight the ones that do have an Android sure. Go version available. I I uh, I mean that sounds good. It doesn't I don't know if it would work because most apps wouldn't have it anyway. Yeah. Like I don't know how many apps are in the Play Store now. Let's just say uh, five hundred million. I don't know. Sure. Like even if one percent has it, that's not. I mean, who cares? That that would never happen. One percent would never have it. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I don't think it's going to matter in the long run. Yeah, it's yeah, it's a tough situation because yeah, the, the not everybody is ever going to have the um, the the flagship devices, uh, you know, of the current year. Um, you know, maybe maybe if they maybe it's good enough that they just make remake their own apps to be lighter and good enough, because the people who are buying these lower end phones they might they might not install more than five apps in addition to the ones that come with the phone. Mm-hmm. So make sure that so, the core experience is is covered, and then just hope yeah. that they can live from there. Yeah, I think that maybe maybe that's enough. Maybe all you need is Gmail and Maps and YouTube, and mm-hmm. maybe that's enough for ninety nine percent of the use cases. Yeah. And it's like they always say, the the future's already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Yep, that's right. Yeah. Um, all right, last thing is, uh, well, almost last thing, is they talked about some VR and AR stuff. Um, so on the daydream side of things, virtual reality, um, they obviously, they, they talked a little bit about there's, you know, lots of new uh, daydream compatible phones that are coming out um, including the galaxy s8 which is going to be getting a software update in the summer Um, but the new interesting hardware thing is that they are going to be coming out with some uh, vr headsets that are standalone headsets so they don't require you to have a a phone to slot into them they don't require you to plug into a pc or anything it's got everything that it needs right there in the headset itself Um, and I would like when I heard that I was like, yeah, okay, duh, like obviously. And then I thought about it and I was like, wait, nobody else has done this yet. And I was I mean, like, it's, it's, what? It's basically a pixel but built into the device without a mobile connection. Yeah. Yeah. Um so instead of being $650, it can be $550. I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um and I yeah, so obviously for for me who already has like a nice phone i would definitely prefer to use the phone and have a nice cheap you know headset to put it in but at the same time like it would be nice if i didn't have to give up my phone to go into vr you know what i mean right and and it's not like vr is 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 not taxing on the phone it it makes the pixel melt basically right so uh Maybe maybe it's good that the dedicated device can be better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and and also, so for example, the as I mentioned, it doesn't need to have a mobile connection. It can have Wi-Fi. That's it. That's all you need. Mm-hmm. So it can be cheaper that way, and then it can also have better performance because it can dedicate those resources to be some, you know, for the processor or GPU. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's nice. Speaking of the GPU, um, they're working on a reference device with Qualcomm. And then uh, Snapdragon. Yeah. And and then <laughs> the actual like devices that'll be, I think, commercially available, um, they've got a couple coming from HTC and from Lenovo. It's gonna be funny when HTC makes more money from their headset than from their new flagship phone for this year. Right, yeah. Hmm. Now, on the other side of things, uh, on AR side, of course, Tango is still going strong. Um, they've or got... in other words, old is new again. <laughs> they, well, except that this time they didn't rename it, right? Um, <laughs> True. They they talked about a, a, a new phone that's going to be coming out with Tango, um, the Asus Zenfo AR, Zenfone AR. Um, c- can you figure out, Ryan, why 
they haven't had like an a Google flagship phone that's t- that's Tango enabled because yeah um so I don't know specifically there was a phone that came out it was a phone tablet thing I don't know right but it came out and it had Tango on it and people thought yeah this is pretty cool but I don't the, think it was like widely commercially available it, though it, it was not um and I think the problem is that whatever tech they use inside of this thing is probably uh expensive okay okay um and then I don't uh, it, so they're calling it a uh, VPS vi- visual positioning system. Mm-hmm. So does that? Because Tango, what it was doing was it was using some kind of uh, radio waves, right, to bounce around things and draw a virtual image. Possibly, yeah, something like that. I think it was like IR or something like that. Right. Okay. So not radio waves, but yeah, IR. So then you need to have a bunch of IR sensors or whatever kind of sensors you need, um, and that can that can make your phone look ugly. <laughs> um, for for reference, please visit um another dead thing, old is new again, the Fire Phone, which had dozens of AR sensors on the front of it, and dozens you, being like four, five or six or eight actually, um, and it looked awful basically. So it could be that it's probably expensive, and mm-hmm. it really just doesn't matter. Well, because like to me, when I think about what could we be doing with the mobile platform to like you know really bring it to the next step like proper ar yeah the phone being able to be aware of exactly where it is in space that is really the direction that that we should be heading i think and i think there's it's it's really interesting that they're still trying to approach it from this angle so tango is let the phone do the mapping and then crowdsource the mapping um you know stores could you know add their own beacons and that would help but Mm -hmm. Stores will never do that unless phones actually come with that support. But phones will never come with that support unless the iPhone does it. So this will never matter. Yeah, so so specifically what they were talking about in the video was um, Google Maps will have, um, in addition to obviously GPS navigation outside, um, it'll have indoor dr- navigation that works using the AR cameras. And um, And this is really interesting to me because like, Indoor maps have been a thing in Google Maps for quite a while, mainly for like big areas like airports or the Mall yeah. of America or Things whatever. Things that don't you know? change frequently. Yeah, but like even like you go to a like a fairly small strip mall like Sunray over here on the east side of St. Mm-hmm. Paul, and like they have a, an indoor layout of those of those stores on Google Maps. Um, and I don't know where they're getting that information from. I certainly didn't go and contribute <laughs> that to, to the Google Maps, you know, map maker or whatever they call that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so like, I, I think that relying on, um, you know, getting, gathering data from people's devices just as they use them naturally is not a, yeah. is not a bad approach. No, it's a great approach. That's what they do for traffic conditions on with google maps mm-hmm. makes perfect sense but i don't think this will ever take off because unless the iphone integrates it it won't happen yeah yeah um the very very last thing that they talked about uh right before ending the um the live stream was google for jobs which is um kind of you know what it reminded me of was it reminded me of when google decided to get into the like flight price tracking oh sure business you know so what it reminds me of is when microsoft bought linkedin (laughs) for no reason yeah what have they even done with that i don't know yeah um but so so basically um if you do a google search for like you know a certain kind of job yeah it it'll it'll pop up with results for that in your area um and they use a whole bunch of different criteria to sort things for you and um you know for example they were talking about um um, commute times right from Mm -hmm. your house to wherever that particular job is um i don't know if they filter by you know like income level um or by like what skills are necessary and that would require them to already have on hand um you know a list of like you know basically your resume of what skills you already have um 
So it'll be interesting to see exactly how this works when it rolls out. Um, but they, of course, were using, say it together, everybody, machine learning Aww. to, um, you know, to, to figure out when you say retail, you know, other like the, the job posters might be using slightly different words to talk about the same kind of job um, so that, you know, so that they can like bring together the search terms with the actual terms right. that show up in, in job applications and et cetera. Yeah. We'll see how it works once it becomes available. Um, yeah. We'll see. Yeah. Um, but I, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm not sad that this new tool exists. Um, yeah, it's fine. Yeah. I do wonder where exactly they're pulling all of the information from of these job listings. Like, are they just, are they just crawling through indeed LinkedIn. and monster <laughs> and like, you know, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question, though. And also, will, will it become a thing where, um, you know, you have a search engine ranking, and now you have a resume ranking? <laughs> no. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, in, in, yeah, instead of SEO, we have uh, um, J, JPO, job posting. Uh, <laughs> yeah, something like that. Yeah. Optimization. Yeah. There you go. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so to close it out, uh, Sundar Pichai at the end of the keynote talked about, you know, it used to be mobile first. So we also, we always used to build for, for phones and tablets and, mm-hmm. you know, mobile, mobile stuff, but now it's AI first. Everything's changed. So I must be an old man because I'm still kind of getting used to this whole mobile first thing. Yeah. I'm totally with you on that. When, when I see a service, an app that is built either for mobile first or, heaven forbid, like mobile only, I just Ugh. go, uh, I'm not going to use that. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Bye. Yeah. I, so my problem with mobile first and AI first is that mobile first was something that anybody could aspire to. You, you, Ian, the school teacher could build an Android app and be mobile first. Yeah. I'm actually thinking about building an Android app this summer. Okay. But you know, what's really hard to do. You school teacher, Ian, probably won't be able to make a competitive ai anytime soon no probably not maybe my (laughs) maybe my college professor could but that's because he's really into machine learning right and so even though google says that it's not mobile first anymore it it, it's not really fair for them to be ai first either because nobody else can be that way either Mm -hmm. so i i uh i don't know about that so maybe i mean it all depends on how good the tools are that google provides for people to play with right because like not enough if 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 google can provide the platforms that you know because obviously google's engineers are pretty darn good at machine learning at, at artificial intelligence so if if they can provide a way for me to just kind of give the idea of what i want it to be able to handle and for what you know for what i want my ai to be able to do and then have them make that happen automatically then that's good but i think other, i think yeah. ai stuff machine learning stuff is a really hard science mm-hmm. and no matter how good the platform is i don't think the tools are there yet i think we're still at least 5 6 7 years away from having it be something where a normal person can learn it in a couple months right right yeah yeah and then make something maybe usable and sellable. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And especially especially if you're relying on other people's platforms. Um, yeah. How are you supposed to be able to sell that? Because it's going to have to utilize something else. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough. It is. So was this a good Google I.O. for you? Um, I think, yeah, mainly the stuff that I'm excited about was... Um, the Google new stuff in Google Photos and um, a little bit the the new stuff in coming in Android O. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. I think I think the Android O stuff is probably my uh, high highlight. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm impressed that they like brought up a bunch of stuff for Android O that I hadn't heard about before. Um, because if I remember correctly, the only stuff the only thing that I was really excited about for Android O was being able to snooze notifications. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny you mention that because The Verge actually put out a video called First Look for Android O, even though it's been out for three months. Right, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> I don't know what they were doing for three months. Uh, uh, not making videos, evidently. 
Yeah, I guess not. Um, it's a good thing that we're, uh, you know, make podcasts in such a timely manner. Hey. By the way, if you want to listen to any of those other uh, podcasts made by us, you can go and find them on thenexus.tv. Um, if you want to give us any feedback on this or any other episodes, you can email us at thenexustv at gmail.com or hit us up on Twitter at thenexustv. Uh, I have been Ian Arbuck. You can find me on Twitter as Ian Arbuck. And of course, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on my website, ryanrampersad.com, and on Twitter at Ryan Amar. Have a good one. Have a good one. Watch out for cards.